Welcome to our viewers at the University of Maryland and around the world. We are so glad that you could join us today for a very special program. My name is Hoda Mahmoudi, holder of the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. We are located uh, in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland College Park. Today's program is co-sponsored with the Critical Race Initiative within the Department of Sociology at the University of Maryland. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Don Dow, who is the director of that program, and our colleague, Dr. Rashan Ray. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our speaker today, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Herf, who I will introduce to you shortly. But first, I need to go over some of the technical matters. Uh, you are muted and your video is off when you join this meeting. Uh, please note that this program is being recorded. By participating, you acknowledge and consent to your image, likeness, or voice possibly being recorded. Uh, we ask that you use the Q&A function at the end of the official program, after Professor Herf's lecture, uh, when we will open the session up for your questions. And we request that you only, well, you limit your questions to the contents of uh, Professor Herf's lecture. The Baha'i Chair for World Peace is actively involved in addressing deep-rooted problems of society, both domestically and globally. We pursue bodies of tested knowledge that can be used to seek a more just, secure, sustainable international order. An international order based on shared human values and ethical and moral considerations that are the foundation for better societies. The Baha'i Chair promotes this vision through an intensive learning process focused on five central themes. These are structural racism and the root causes of prejudice, human nature, women's equality, the challenges of global governance, and the challenges of the environment. Professor Herf's presentation today addresses anti-Semitism and the falsehoods that support it. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. The numbers confirm what we feel in our bones. Things are getting worse. Anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish harassment and violence is up 12% from year to year. Two out of three American Jews feel less safe than they did 10 years ago. In Europe, the diasporic heart of Judaism in the West Nine out of 10 feel less safe. Anti-Semitism matters because it demands the same nettlesome work that is needed to advance all aspects of humanity, a commitment to acts of betterment within the circle of our own influence. So we are really honored today to have with us Professor Jeffrey I've tried to get him to speak for us before, but he's such a busy scholar that uh, finally we've managed to get him to speak for us today. Dr. Herf is Distinguished Professor in the Department of History at the University of Maryland College Park, where he specializes in history of modern Europe and Germany. He has published extensively on the topic of anti-Semitism. He received his doctorate from Brandeis University in 1981 and has taught at Harvard University and at Ohio University before coming to College Park in 2000. His recent publications include Undeclared Wars with Israel, East Germany and West German Radical Left, 1967, to 1989 by Cambridge University Press. Another book, Nazi Propaganda for the Arab World, 
which was published in 2009, won and was awarded the Sybil Milton Prize of the German Studies Association in 2011. The Jewish enemy, Nazi propaganda during World War II and the Holocaust, uh, also won a National Award Jewish Book Award in 2007. The Divided Memory, the Nazi Past in the Two Germanies, published in 1997, was awarded the George Lewis Beer Award, American Historical Association, in 1997. More recently, uh, Professor Herf has co-edited a volume on anti-Semitism before and since the Holocaust, Altered Contexts and Recent Perspectives, uh, published in the spring of 2017. And he has just completed the draft of a book entitled Israel's Moment, Support and Opposition in the United States and Europe, 1944 to 1949. So you can see that uh, Professor Herf has many, many publications on this very important topic and we are really looking forward to his talk today. Uh, we have changed the title of his talk from what was advertised. The title now is The Three Faces of Anti-Semitism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Herf. Professor Mahmoudi, thank you very, very much for that very kind introduction and for this invitation. Uh, the University of Maryland is and will play a very important role in the United States and around the world in bringing the scholarship of historians and social scientists to bear on questions of race and ethnicity and religion to foster mutual understanding and uh, to, uh, to bring decades and decades of scholarship um, uh, on the issues I'm talking about. And also I want to bring attention to my colleagues in the history department uh, who have done so much fine work on the history of white racism, slavery and their aftermath. I'm also delighted that this talk is co-sponsored by the Department of Sociology uh, because I think it's very important that the humanities and social sciences, history and the social sciences work together to address these issues. Anti-Semitism. <clears throat> Hatred and negative stereotypes about Judaism and the Jews has a long history. And it has its most important beginnings in the Christian gospels and the accusation of deicide. And then it persisted in a different cultural context in the text of the Quran, uh, which uh, stated that the Jews uh, murdered the prophets that God sent. Both monotheistic religions took a straight aim at their predecessor. So let's be frank, as long as there are people in this world who read the New Testament and the Quran as literal truth, who do not read it with the irony and skepticism of a modern person, but as the word of God, as long as that's the case, these very widespread, very popular books are going to foster anti-Semitism. Since the emergence of the Zionist project in Palestine, and then the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, the old accusations against the supposedly powerful and evil Jew, or Jews, evolved into accusations of a new powerful and evil entity, the Zionists, who now were imperialist aggressors and colonialists who spread lies about something called the Holocaust, which presumably didn't happen, in order to extort money from the German government and to justify the expulsion of the Palestinians from their homeland. After the Holocaust, which happened, and the defeat of Nazism, it appeared in Europe and the United States that this longest hatred had finally been consigned to the past. This hope has not been fulfilled. What I want to do in the next 35 minutes or so is to examine a few of the most important 
chapters in the 20th century in the modern history of anti-Semitism, and by so doing, attempt to explain how and why this most ancient of hatreds has evolved into a factor of contemporary history and politics. The defining aspect of our historical moment in the longer history of anti-Semitism is that it has three faces. Nazism, neo-Nazism, and the racist far right. The after effects of communist and the radical leftist attack on Zionism and Israel. And Islamist ideology and politics in both their Sunni Arab and Shia Iranian forms. These three forms, faces. Despite their ideological, uh, their differing ideological and cultural starting points, these three faces of anti-Semitism share with the ancient pre-modern hatred a core conspiracy theory focused on the powerful and the evil Jew or the aggressive and imperialist Zionist in our times. The far right in the streets of Charlottesville bellowed that the Jews will not replace us. In doing so, it blamed an, assorted, an assortment of international Jews and coastal elites for threatening what they called white genocide by supporting immigration and defending a multi-ethnic society. Here in Charlottesville, the link between the hatred of the Jews and the hatred of other peoples of color was most apparent. As a result of the rise of Trump and Trumpism, the habit of conspiracy theorizing has entered, uh, has entered the mainstream of our politics. Uh, and the link between the hatred of the Jews uh, and the hatred of other peoples of colors has become uh, 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 one that uh, is now, uh, unfortunately, uh, not only on the fringes of American politics, but at times finds itself, uh, finds echoes in the tweets of the President of the United States. Despite his support for Israel's conservative government, Trump's refusal to condemn right-wing extremists and his attacks on the deep state have brought this kind of conspiratorial thinking, as I said, into the mainstream of our politics. In attacks in the United States, New Zealand, and Germany in recent years, these right-wing extremists have demonstrated their willingness to murder Jews in the name of these conspiracy theories, which most clearly connect the hatred of Jews with the tradition of white racism. I begin with this comment because here at the University of Maryland, I don't know what happens elsewhere in the world, and I don't know what happens at other universities, but here at the University of Maryland, we faculty, oppose anti-Semitism, and we oppose racism towards people of color, exclamation point, period, full stop. And we do not oppose one or the other, we oppose them both in the best way that we can do, that is through our scholarship. Not one or the other, but both and. That's the University of Maryland in College Park. As contemporary right-wing extremism draws on the legacies of Nazism, I take this opportunity to discuss my scholarship in connection with the conspiracy theories that were so important for implementing the Holocaust. The core of radical anti-Semitism, and by radical anti-Semitism, I mean a hatred that is beyond you cannot join our country club or we're going to have a quote at the university uh, or we don't like the way you look uh, or you can't marry my daughter or a son. I mean, a kind of anti-Semitism that leads to mass murder. The core of that radical anti-Semitism was a conspiracy theory, again, that imputed enormous power, not inferiority, but power and devilish intelligence to an international conspiracy, the purpose of which was to destroy the Nazi regime and exterminate the German people. This conspiracy theory was prefigured earlier in the 20th century by the notorious forgery, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The propaganda accomplishment of Hitler and his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, and the propagandists at the German Foreign Ministry during World War II was to update this conspiracy theory and fill it with the names and people, the names of people who were actually involved in politics in the Soviet Union, Britain, and the United States. Uh, 
every conspiracy has a little bit of connection to reality, which it then extort, it distorts. The story of the Nazi conspiracy theory during World War II was the following. An international Jewish conspiracy had seized power here in Washington, D.C., in London, and in Moscow. Working cleverly behind the scenes, it had seized control of the governments led by Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin. These apparently very powerful individuals were in fact mere tools of this conspiracy working behind the scenes. Uh, and because this conspiracy was intent on exterminating the German people, Hitler and the Nazis declared they were engaged in a war of righteous self-defense to prevent this horrendous act and to murder the murderers before they had the chance to engage in their genocide of the Jews. Um, this anti-Semitism was not only a set of stereotypes uh, or a bundle of prejudices. We are con we're, the term prejudice is very common in these discussions. It was a form of interpretation. It was an ideological framework. It purported to explain the events of history. Uh, and the, um, <clears throat> the more that the war continued, the more that the Allies were succeeding in defeating the German armies and bombing the German cities, the more the Nazi regime seemed to be convinced that its conspiracy theory was true. One of the most frightening things about the radical conspiracy theory of anti-Semitism and any conspiracy theory is that its adherents often, often tend to believe that it is in fact the truth, that they do not see it only as an instrument uh, or, or, or a tool uh, to delude the others, but they become deluded themselves. Uh, another aspect of this conspiracy theory that I want to draw to your attention is this. It was not fundamentally and most importantly an assertion about what Jews looked like. It was not primarily about the physical appearance about the Jews. The Nazis were so uncertain what Jews actually looked like, that they made Jews wear a yellow star because they were afraid that there were a lot of six foot one, blonde haired, blue eyed men and women walking around the cities of Berlin, uh, the cities of Germany, who were Jewish. Radical anti Semitism then was fundamentally a political accusation, an accusation that purported that there was a political actor a real actor like the Communist Party or the Democratic Party or the British government, a real actor in world politics called international jury that was doing things, that was active. And because it was doing these things and active, it, retaliation was necessary. So a very important aspect of every conspiracy theory is the reversal of cause and effect. It was Hitler who started the war. It was Hitler who launched the final solution. The Jews had no state. The Jews were powerless. It was all a fiction. But the conspiracy theory reversed all the causal arrows. And the social scientists in the audience will know very well what I mean when I talk about reversing the causal arrows. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the evidence of this, uh, as I pointed out in the book, The Jewish Enemy, was astonishingly public. That was the whole point. There was nothing secret about the conspiracy theory. Um, the, um, on numerous occasions, in public, on the radio, in the press, Hitler and in party rallies, um, Hitler and his associates denounced what they called the Jewish enemy uh, and promised their followers that they would defend Germany against it, uh, against this as I said, racially defined, politically, uh, politically active subject in contemporary history. 
Uh, th this anti-Semitism, <clears throat> in that sense, radical anti-Semitism, is different than white racism, racism towards people of color. That's the racism that we are most, th that is, we're most familiar with, and in a way seems easiest to understand. Uh, that when you say the word racism, immediately we think about color. And anti-Semitism is not about color. It's it's not, radical anti-Semitism is not even primarily about the way people supposedly look. Uh, radical anti-Semitism is fundamentally about a, the most dangerous conspiracy theory uh, that, has, that has been invented. And it's really uh, uh, the, uh, that I, the source of many other conspiracy theories. Uh, now, there was pornographic anti-Semitism, of course, in Nazi Germany, and there still is. Uh, and anti-Semitism does include uh, uh, pejorative uh, stereotypes of what Jews supposedly look like, and I'm not, those are familiar to the audience, and I'm not going to repeat that uh, kind of nonsense. But uh, the, the leap, the break with civilization that led to Auschwitz-Birkenau and Majdanek and Sobibor and Belgic and the death camps and the Einsatzgruppen and the mass shootings, that break with civilization was not fundamentally based on revulsion with what the Jews looked like, as, as repulsed as the, the anti-Semites were with, what, with their stereotypes about what Jews supposedly looked like. The break with civilization and the decision to launch the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe um, was part of that paranoid conspiracy theory about the Jews acting. And like other conspiracy theories, it solved deep riddles. And there were some riddles about the Second World War. Why did Britain ally with communist Soviet Union in June of 1941 when Hitler attacked the Soviet Union? Why did the imperialist and anti-communist Winston Churchill immediately write to Joseph Stalin to offer an alliance against Hitler? What sense did that make? Why did Churchill refuse to do a deal with Hitler in the summer of 1940 when they could have formed an alliance of the Western Christian world against the atheists, the Jewish atheists, the Jewish Bolsheviks in Moscow. Why did Churchill pass up that opportunity? Why, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, did an alliance emerge between England and the United States on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other? Now, there was the small detail that Hitler declared war on the United States, but that that let's not bother with such details. Why was there an alliance of the two imperialist capitalist Anglo-Saxon powers with the Jewish Bolsheviks? What sense did that make? None. And why did the anti-Hitler coalition between Britain and the United States on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other persist as the Red Army moved west towards Germany? threatening the rest of Europe. Why didn't the United States and Britain decide at that point to support Nazi Germany in fighting the communists? Why, in other words, was there an unnatural alliance of the Western democracies and the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany? Now, common sense and a little bit of knowledge of history which many of you have, most of you have, would tell us that the reason that Stalin and, Hit and, and Churchill and Roosevelt formed an alliance of convenience against Hitler was because they regarded him as the primary threat to peace and to Europe, and that uh, the alliance with Stalin for Churchill and Roosevelt was the lesser evil of, uh, a lesser evil than Hitler. Um, it's important to keep in mind that there were people in the United States, notably Charles Lindbergh, but others, who used the expression America first to insist that what happened in Europe was none of the business of the United States. 
and that Hitler was a bulwark against communism <clears throat> and that we would be much better off just letting all of them fight it out by themselves and maybe even helping Hitler a little bit <clears throat> to prevent the Soviet Union from expanding further into Europe. America first. <clears throat> The anti-Semitic conspiracy theory was the explanation of the riddle of the Second World War. For the Nazis, the reason that, the so that, the so that Britain and the United States allied with the Soviet Union was because international jury operating behind the scenes in Moscow, London, and Washington had created this unnatural alliance in order to exterminate the Germans that it was not in the interest of the Soviet Union or it was certainly not in the interest of Britain and the United States to go to war against Nazi Germany. And so the only explanation as to why it happened was this vast power of the Jews. And every bomb that fell, fell on Hamburg or Dresden or Berlin or Munich convinced somebody in Germany that the Nazis were right. You see, Hitler was right. He said that, that the Jews were coming to kill us and look, our apartment building just went up in flames. And my family is dead. And the city, of the, the city of Hamburg just had a firestorm. And 20,000 people died in Dresden. And you see the Jews are now coming to kill. You see, Hitler was right. Not that the British and the Anglo-American air campaign was the cause, but it was the Jews who were behind it. Um, the, um, uh, again, this was very public. And for those of you who know something about the history of the Third Reich, I'll be telling you, reminding you of things that you're quite familiar with. The most famous text, the key text of the Nazi conspiracy theory was a speech that Hitler gave on January 30th of 1939 to the German parliament called the Reichstag. By 1939, the Reichstag was a powerless joke uh, uh, filled uh, with uh, Nazi members of the Nazi party and nobody else. And uh, Hitler, in that very famous speech, which subsequently was called the prophecy speech, said that if international jury, once again, supposedly, the Jews also were responsible for World War I, if it once again plunged the peoples of Europe into war, then this time it would not end in the, uh, the annihilation of the, what he called the Aryan race, but it would end in the extermination of the Jewish race in Europe. Uh, that is the famous prophecy of January 30th, 1939. And it was a prophecy that Hitler repeated on a number of different occasions in 1942 and 1943 in famous speeches that were broadcast on the radio, uh, published in the major press and published by the way in the world press as well. They were, there was nothing secret about it. He was proud of it. In the fall of 1941, his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, uh, uh, who had a famous reputation as a liar, uh, also uh, had occasionally, uh, uh, occasionally told the truth. And on November 16th of 1941, he gave a speech on the radio and in an essay in a leading Nazi newspaper called The Jews Are Guilty. In his 1939 speech, Hitler said, if the Jews th do this, then we will exterminate them. What Goebbels did in November of 1941 was to say, it's happening. It's happening that uh, the, um, the prophecy was giving way to ongoing action. The Jews wanted their war and now they had it. Uh, by unleashing this war, Goebbels said, world jury completely misjudged the forces at its disposal. And now the propaganda minister said publicly, the Jews are suffering a gradual process of annihilation, or jury is suffering a gradual process of annihilation, which had it intended for us, and which it would have unleashed against us without hesitation if it had the power to do so. They wish, um, <clears throat> and so Goebbels here said the Jews were now, now suffering a gradual process of extermination. Now, auf Deutsch, uh, the Allmähliche Prozess der uh, 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 Vernichtung it doesn't sound nice. It's not a normal term. Uh, it, it sounds as bad in German as it does in English translation. 
and somebody who was listening, who had an elementary level of political sophistication, would know that the propaganda that the propaganda minister of the government was telling the German people in November of 1941 that it was now going to be government policy to engage in mass murder. My fellow historians who have worked on the decision-making that led to the Holocaust have written many, many fine books that indicate that by November of 1941, Hitler had in fact taken the fundamental decisions that extended the mass shootings on the Eastern Front that began in June of 1941 into a program of continent-wide genocide. So Goebbels, in short, knew what he was talking about. And he was telling the German listeners that this, in fact, was going on. Not as a source of shame, not as something to be, uh, to, but as a source of pride uh, that now this vast conspiracy had met its match in the Nazi uh, regime. Uh, the, um, uh, now things didn't go too well for the Nazi regime. Uh, things went very well for the Nazi regime uh, from 1939 to uh, December, January of 1942-43, when the Red Army uh, won the Battle of Stalingrad and began, the that was the major turning point of the Second World War in Europe, and the Red Army began its long march to the West, decimating the Wehrmacht uh, in the process. Uh, the um, Anglo, -Amer the United States and Britain, unable to get onto the continent until 1945, waged war from the air and destroyed the German Air Force, uh, also killed 600,000 German civilians in the course of bombing campaign in 1942, 43, and 44. Uh, by the time that the United States and Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and others landed at D-Day, uh, the German Air Force was almost non-existent. Uh, the United States and Britain played an absolutely crucial role in the victory over Nazi Germany, both in what they did on the battlefield and in the assistance they gave to the Soviet Union, which Stalin understood was indispensable uh, for the Soviet victory. So what was the Nazi explanation for the loss of the war? Now, historians have explained that there's a simple explanation for the loss of the war. Germany was a medium-sized country that antagonized everybody, especially the three most powerful countries in the world, and it just was not big enough, and its armies were not large enough to defeat the Soviet Union, the United States, and Britain at the same time. And a rational man or woman who had been at the head of the German government would never have started the Second World War in the first place. Now that simplifies very large books, um, but it's the essence of things. Joseph Goebbels, however, used the conspiracy theory to offer a different explanation as to why Nazi Germany lost the Second World War. You are probably, many of you, familiar with the first stab in the back legend of the German Reich in the 1920s, which was that Germany didn't lose the war on the battlefield, but was stabbed in the back by a bunch of socialists and communists and liberals in Berlin uh, and Jews. Uh, and that's why Germany lost World War I. Well, Goebbels came up with the second less famous, but interesting stab in the back legend. And it was this, Germany was stabbed in the back by Britain and the United States because the Jews had seized power in London and Washington and those idiots, instead of joining an anti-communist crusade that Hitler was waging against the Soviet Union, those fools in Washington and London decided to help the commies and what happened? They stabbed Nazi Germany in the back. The uh, European West and the plutocratically led USA gave the Soviet military backing on flanks and tied our hands with which we are still trying to strike Bolshevism to the ground. Um, that was Goebbels and the Nazis' explanation as to why they lost the Second World War. Um, 
I come back to the slogan America first because I wanted, I, I'm, for reasons that are obvious to the audience. America first, which Trump revived, was a central theme of American, the American variant of fascism in the 1930s. And it was the view that the United States was dragged into the war in Europe by the Jews and other East Coast elites embodied in Franklin Roosevelt. The historic association of the term America first with anti-Semitism and with the view of American entry into the European war, that, that, that entry into the war was a mistake, <clears throat> is undeniable. It simply defies credibility that the president and his supporters are unaware of the anti-Semitism that is attached to the term America first and unaware of the idea that advocates of America first thought that Hitler was the necessary bulwark against the spread of communism in Europe. But these days, one cannot take for granted anything about what people know and don't know about the past. The term America first is not historically innocent at all. And it is an important chapter in the long history of anti-Semitism. Hitler repeated all of this nonsense before he shot himself in the head uh, on April 29, uh, uh, at, at the beginning of May of 45, when he blamed the war on the Jews. Um, and, um, uh, the, uh, uh, and what he said in the bunker uh, was not the product of a, uh, a, a person crazed uh, with a with, uh, drug-induced craze, it was the same statement, the same conspiracy theory that he had been expressing since 1939. Um, I speak for another 10 minutes and I've spoken a long time about Nazism and so there won't be as much time to speak about Islamism uh, and, the, and the, the radical left. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna compress and summarize here. Um, uh, and this is delicate, sensitive material. Uh, so uh, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm gonna be as clear as I possibly can be. The religion of Islam has coexisted with Jews and with Christians um, at various times in many places. And it is a religion that like other religions can be interpreted in various ways. Some of them very pleasant, some of them not so pleasant. The same is true of Christianity and the same is true of Judaism. So we're all adults here. In the middle of the 20th century, in Egypt and in Palestine, a number, several ideologues, Hassan al-Banna and Hajimin al-Husseini, wrote canonical texts that began a modern tradition called Islamism. Islamism. It had a lot to do with the religion of Islam. It was an interpretation of the religion of Islam. It is not synonymous with the religion of Islam, but it is also not true that it has nothing to do with the religion of Islam. This is something we tell grade school children. What the Islamists argued was that the, in their view, their view, the religion of Islam was an inherently anti-Semitic religion that the Jews had attacked Muhammad in Medina, that the Jews had always been hostile to Islam, and that Islamism understood the essence of the hostile and powerful nature of the Jews. And the Jews had been attacking Islam uh, since the life of Muhammad. And a key text of this, which I don't have time to elaborate on much, was by Hajimin al-Husseini, a key figure in our history, in this history, who became a leader of Palestinian nationalism before and uh, after World War II. Uh, and in 1937, before he became uh, uh, associated with the Nazis, uh, he said the, in, in a classic statement on Islam and the Jews, the battle between the Jews and Islam began when Muhammad fled from Mecca to Medina. Therefore, they were seized by a deep hatred against Islam. Uh, and he interpreted Zionism 
through this religious lens, his interpretation, not mine, his interpretation of the religion of Islam as a uh, Zionism was simply the latest chapter in the centuries long attack on, uh, on Islam by the Jews. Hajim and Husseini came to the attention of the German government. Uh, Islam and the Jews was translated into German and published in Berlin in 1938. There's a long history of his uh, illustrious career. Uh, he wound up in Berlin in 1941. There's a famous photo of him uh, uh, speaking with Hitler in Nazi propaganda for the Arab world. I spoke about the many speeches he gave from Berlin that were broadcast by shortwave radio uh, to, in Arabic uh, to the Middle East. Um, they were picked up uh, by the American uh, uh, embassy in Cairo, uh, uh, tape recorded. The, the Americans, uh, the tape recorder was invented in the 1930s and the Americans had them. And they also had native Arab speaker, speakers working in the embassy and they produced about 3000 pages of English language transcripts of Nazi Germany's Arabic language broadcast to the Middle East, which I found in the National Archives in 2007 and they are now uh, and they are they formed uh, an important component of the book Nazi Propaganda for the Arab World. Hitler and Goebbels told the German people that the Nazi regime was killing the Jews. Hajim and al-Husseini on the radio from Berlin urged the, urged the Arabs to take matters into their own hands um, and kill the Jews themselves. Uh, the, I, I'm not going to repeat, uh, and I don't have time to repeat, uh, the text of those broadcasts. Uh, suffice it to say that uh, the collaboration between Husseini and other Arabs in Berlin was close and intense and real and famous and public. There was nothing secret about it. It was well known in the world press. It was well known here in the United States. It was well known in Britain uh, uh, and it was well known in Germany. Hajim and Husseini was a world famous figure during World War II. And it was Hajim and al Husseini who uh, was able to escape very lenient uh, custody by the French government. After the war, he was under house arrest. Uh, Congressman Emanuel Seller and Senator Robert Wagner, uh, a, a, a senator from New York, a congressman from Brooklyn, were calling for the arrest and indictment and trial of Hajim and al Husseini on war crimes, as were many other people in this country. Uh, but miraculously, quote unquote, uh, Husseini escaped. The French foreign ministry thought it might be beneficial to have him in the Middle East uh, to serve French interests. Uh, and uh, he was welcomed as a hero by the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood. And Husseini played a decisive role in rejecting the excellent compromise proposal uh, adopted at the United Nations in November of 1947 that would have created an Arab state in Palestine with, by the way, this is important, people forget this or they never knew it, uh, the Arab state in Palestine of 1947 would have had a sea coast in Gaza and a sea coast in what is now northern Israel. Lots of beachfront um, uh, and a Jewish state, much smaller than the existing state of Israel, uh, but two states. Uh, Hajim and al Husseini led the opposition to that compromise. And instead of accepting that compromise and that two state solution that was on the table there um, and that was supported by the United States and the Soviet Union, waged war to destroy the Zionist project. Um, the, um, uh, it's important for this audience to recall or perhaps know for the first time that the strongest support for the Zionist project in the United Nations from May of 47 to December or to the early spring of 49, the strongest support did not come from the United States. The strongest support came from the Soviet Union and from Poland and Czechoslovakia, that is the Soviet bloc. The United States, President Truman supported the state, but the Pentagon uh, and the military, the State Department were not happy about the Zionist project because it would make access to the oil difficult and because, and this is not well known, the Zionist project in conservative circles in the United States and in the military and in the diplomatic corps was associated with the communists. Jews and communism, Jews and Zionism, Zionism and communism. Lots of skepticism about this Zionist project. 
The idea that Israel was the creation of U.S. imperialism is one of those fictions of Soviet propaganda that somehow entered into the Western left. But as you know, or many of you know, the Soviet Union and Stalin flipped after 1949, and Stalin realized that he had made a mistake. It turned out that the Jews who came to Israel to form the Jewish state were not communists. There was a communist party, and in 1949, this Israeli communist party received 3% of the vote. The majority were democratic socialists who did not like communist dictatorship, and Stalin realized he had made a bet. It did not work out, and instead, he turned to an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory in Europe and purged, called the Anti-Cosmopolitan Campaign, and purged Jews from positions of power. And from then on, the same power that had gained world prestige as a result of the incredible suffering and sacrifices of the Red Army, 8 million soldiers died in the course of the Second World War in the Red Army. Uh, in, as a result of gaining enormous prestige uh, for having defeated Nazi Germany and made the phrase anti-fascism a key word of world politics and a positive word, the same power used this prestige now after 1949 and then into the early 50s to wage a four decade long propaganda campaign against the Zionist state and to redefine the Zionist project, which, was, which emerged out of the fight against racism and anti-Semitism into a new fiction into an outpost of US imperialism, an outpost of racism and imperialism, ideas which, sad to say, um, find some echo on American campuses. The Western New Left in Germany and the United States uh, was influenced by the Soviet turn. And the phrase anti-racism and anti-fascism were now redefined. Astonishingly, people attacked the Jewish state, the survivors of the Holocaust, in the name of anti-fascism. So what is a real anti-fascist beginning in the 1960s and after? For Yasser Arafat, or for German new leftists who you who, whose names are not as familiar, Dieter Kunzelmann or Ulrike Meinhof, uh, an anti-fascist is one who attacks the Jews, attacks the Zionists. The emotional power of anti-racism and anti-fascism played a very important role in reviving the anti-Semitic tradition. As long as it was associated with Hitler and the Nazis, it was disrespectable. And uh, not acceptable in polite company, but associated with anti-fascism and anti-racism, it gave, it lent it a new, new lease on life. So uh, I conclude now. Um, the, um, <clears throat> oftentimes we, histori we historians know that when people think that they are innovating and inventing something completely new, they are often repeating very old habits. Sad to say, the vast traditions of Christianity and Islam, the vast traditions of communism and the radical left, huge political and religious traditions, all of which can be interpreted in different ways, have contributed to the persistence of this hatred. So it's gonna be with us for a while. And it's time, it's important that we face and acknowledge that reality uh, in order to fight it. The um, second point I would make is that this little journey through conspiracy theories is very serious today because of the internet. There are no gatekeepers on Facebook and Twitter, this vast electronic sewer. And so the most absurd conspiracy theories 
can now travel around the world in warp speed uh, with great ease. That's certainly good for the history of anti-Semitism and its conspiracy theories. Uh, the, um, uh, those conspiracy theories, and I'm returning to points I made at the outset, were evident on the streets of Charlottesville. They were there in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. They are there every time somebody chants America first. They are there when we hear about a supposed deep state in this metropolitan area in Washington, DC, that is supposedly challenging the president and threatening our liberal democracy and its norms. So what can we historians do? We've demonstrated that his anti-Semitism rests on lies and myths that are deeply embedded in our major religious and secular traditions. And we've demonstrated that its most dangerous form is the paranoia inherent in a conspiracy theory. And that is common to all three faces of anti-Semitism today. We don't need to reinvent the wheel in the study of anti-Semitism. There is a host of excellent scholarship to read. And this evening, I've offered you just some examples of what, what this historian has revealed about some chapters in the history of this longest hatred. But there are many, many other historians who have done superb and important work. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need huge, massive, expensive new study commissions. We need to read the books that are there. Uh, and if I would end on a positive, somewhat positive note after this grim talk, I take some solace uh, in the work that I have done and the work of my colleagues. Uh, because we have spent our professional lives, part of them at any rate, examining some of the most evil chapters. Um, in history in the hope that doing so and writing truthfully about them will make some contribution, however modest, that such things never happen again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Herr, for that outstanding presentation. Uh, we really appreciate the depth of the historical perspective that you've provided about this important topic. And uh, I, I agree with you that all of us need to read a lot more because there is so much available already about this topic. Um, I'd like to now move on to the question and answer uh, session. And as you know, there is a Q and A uh, button or function on the bottom of your screen. So please, uh, if you have a question, go to that function and pose your question. I'd like to read you the first one, uh, Professor Herf. Um, the question is, uh, did you say that America First is associated with Hitler? If so, why do so many Jewish people support President Trump? Why, does the white, why do the white evangelical Christians support President Trump? Do the general public know this information? America First was not associated with Hitler. America First was associated, thank you for the question. America First was associated with those who opposed American entry into the First World, into the Second World War. And many of those who opposed entry into the First, into the Second World War did so because they were, they were anti-Semites. Uh, and uh, the idea, uh, the, the Nazi regime, uh, with its embassy here in Washington, that it was open until 1941, was intent on making the Second World War above all about the Jews, so that the American people would conclude that we were gonna send our boys to Europe in order to save the Jews? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, 
And the, uh, the Roosevelt administration, and this is another controversy, but related, was doing all it could to say, no, 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 in 1939, 40, 41, what is the war about? It's to defend Britain and to prevent the defeat of Britain. Because the Roosevelt administration and the president himself was aware of American fascism and American anti-Semitism. And the last thing that he wanted to see happen was that the war should be overwhelmingly identified as a crusade to save Europe's Jews. And if that happened, uh, the opposition to it uh, would, would intensify. Um, uh, I don't want to get too much into the issue of um, uh, overwhelmingly Jews are going to vote for Biden. Uh, there is no other group of white voters in the United States uh, that will be voting for, the, for Biden and the Democrats in as large percentage as the Jews, as the Jewish voters in the United States. And that has been true uh, uh, certainly ever since, uh, uh, well, you, it, before the civil rights movement, but uh, in that sense, uh, Jewish white voters are an anomaly. Um, uh, uh, and that has something to do, I think, with uh, uh, the, both the traditions of Judaism and the experience of Jews, uh, uh, the visceral experience in, uh, of anti-Semitism and a, a, common, a commonality with, uh, with what uh, African Americans have endured uh, in, in the course of our country's long history. Uh, the, uh, I, I have written a, a short piece at the Times of Israel website uh, on um, the, the uh, Trump is good for Israel illusion. You can Google that. And I think, uh, I don't, I don't want to go uh, in, into great detail. I'll say this, um, that I didn't talk about Iran in my talk. Like one can't talk about everything. But uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran is the first government since the defeat of Nazi Germany, which placed radical anti-Semitism at the core of its governing ideology. It's not, on the, it's not an afterthought, it's not an aside, it's not a minor thing, it's a major thing. And uh, the, uh, the combination of that with the Iranian nuclear program uh, and uh, President Obama's rhetorical reluctance to focus on the anti-Semitic dimension in Iran uh, angered many Jewish voters in the United States. And uh, so I think that in the, uh, I think they're mistaken uh, in, in those views, uh, but I think that it's that fear of a second Holocaust, frankly, uh, that, uh, that, is, that sits deep in Jewish bones, that, uh, uh, th that explains some of, those, some of those sentiments. But I think I would say, again, I repeat the point I made at the outset, uh, more than any other group of white voters in this country, Jewish voters over and over again, um, have um, uh, voted alongside those politicians who support the civil rights movement and who, uh, who uh, oppose uh, such policies. But. Okay, thank you. There's an anonymous attendee who has asked, Hello, Dr. Herf. I have found current anti-Semitism in the Baha'i faith, including regular statements supporting the Jewish deicide myth and objectionable material concerning Jews and the Holocaust. And it goes on. I don't need to tell you the rest of it, but basically saying uh, that, you know, how can uh, uh, anti-Semitism in the Baha'i faith and its promotion of the Jewish deicide myth at the University of Maryland and other academic institutions uh, be addressed? One of the things that I found mo most, uh, that I find very troubling about our public discourse is that many people seem to think they know what goes on in the universities and, th and, uh, and they don't. And they imagine some kind of nightmare place where our universities are filled with anti-Semites. And uh, uh, I think the, uh, I, I'm, this evening I'm not going to present myself as, a, as an authority on the Baha'i faith. So I, I, I you know, I, 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 I think the evidence of this talk and, and Professor Mahmoudi's invitation speaks for itself. Uh, I, I think that that's, uh, I, I want to repeat what I said at the outset about what is special about the University of Maryland. It's not as if the University of Maryland is totally different than other universities, no. But this is a multi-ethnic and multi-religious institution in its student body and in its faculty. And, uh, uh, and we scholars, we students, staff are devoted to making this work. And uh, uh, so if, we, if, if that wasn't the case, I wouldn't be speaking to you today at the invitation of the Baha'i chair. 
Um, uh, I uh, again, I I'm going to defer. Perhaps Professor Mahmoudi wants to talk, uh, wants to address that question, uh, uh, but I can't. I'm I'm not. I don't present myself as as uh, having done any scholarly work on th this issue. I would say this. After the Holocaust, uh, and perhaps this audience knows this very well, uh, the Catholic Church, for the first time in its 1,965 years, uh, concluded that it had made a mistake, and that, in fact, uh, the Jews did not kill Jesus uh, at the Second Vatican Council uh, under Pope John XXIII. Uh, and th that was a direct result of reflection on the Holocaust and thinking about where it led. And the Protestant churches in Europe uh, and in the United States uh, uh, engaged in similar kind of self-criticism um, and reflection. Uh, the, um, I hope that a young generation of uh, perhaps refugees from Syria, perhaps uh, people in the Iranian diaspora, uh, perhaps young Egyptians who have seen where all this has led, um, that that younger generation of, of young Muslims, Arabs, Iranians, Pakistanis, uh, will begin the kind of intellectual and scholarly uh, confrontation with the Islamist tradition that took place in Europe and the United States in the aftermath of the Holocaust regarding Christianity. Uh, that I, th I think that would be a welcome development. I think that's all I want to say about that. All right, thank you. So from Deborah Glaser, I believe that social justice was the name of the newspaper associated with the well-known Catholic anti-Semite Father Coughlin. Uh, so does the slogan social justice of today bring notions of anti-Semitism with it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, uh, that would, that, that would, uh, uh, I can understand why you posed the question because I was so emphatic about America first. Mm -hmm. But social justice is one of those phrases that rolls off the tongue um, and off the pages of the Torah, by the way, uh, on many pages of the Torah. Um, uh, and uh, so it's embedded in, in the traditions of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam that social mm -hmm. justice is a good thing. I, don't, I think social justice is a good thing. Um, I think, the, I think that the slogan America First has a very distinct historical origin. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas the term social justice, um, associated as it is with many different traditions, does not have that same immediate pejorative connotation. Thank you. Uh, Katie Ellison asks, are there historical alliances, communities built between Jews and Muslims, Palestinians, American government, stretching just as far back as the animosity and conspiracies you discussed that can be leveraged and built upon? Oh, goodness me. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, the, the, the uh, uh, I, I don't want to get into the details of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. Uh, the, uh, I, I think uh, uh, I, I, I do, I, I will say this. I get emails from uh, Kuwait, from Egypt, uh, even from Iraq. Uh, from Arab students who have read my work and find it very interesting. Uh, and uh, that's a source of hope. The problem with Palestinian nationalism is that the Palestinians have told themselves a story about what happened in 1947 and 1948 that is not true. And the story has been repeated again and again and again. Uh, and it's a terrible tragedy that the Palestinians turned down the fine offer they had in 1947. They would by now, along with the Jews, have a flourishing state uh, uh, for 70 years. 
whether there are young Palestinians today who connect with young Israelis. I assume that there are such groups. In fact, I know there are such groups, okay? Uh, my colleague Omar Bartoff at, Ro at Brown University uh, mm -hmm. is involved in attempting to facilitate exactly that kind of conversation and discussion. I wish him all the best. Uh, I, I hope that develops into something al along those lines. That would be marvelous. Um, but in order for that to happen, uh, just as the Catholic Church looked in the mirror in 1965 and said, we don't like what we see. And just as the Lutheran Church looked in the mirror and said, you know, Martin Luther, there was a good Martin Luther, and Martin Luther, and then there was another Martin Luther. And we've got to face the truth about this Martin Luther who wrote the Jews and their lies. There needs to be Palestinian intellectuals and historians who will look at 1947 and 48 and stop repeating the stories about expulsion and imperialism and racism again and again and again uh, and engage in a kind of criticism and self-criticism to, to do what historians do. And I, I, when I say that, I don't mean to suggest that the state of Israel has, uh, has all, everything it's done has just been fantastic and fine and all that. But the path to peace requires self-criticism uh, uh, on the part of the other side as well. And uh, so I think that that's uh, something that would be helpful. And that's something that Palestinian intellectuals and scholars need to hear from their American and European colleagues as well. Not just denunciations of Israel, but some acknowledgement that, um, that there's a, there are things that could have been and should have been done differently. Thank you. Uh, from Eric Lindquist, do you see any connection between Nazism and 19th century ideological anti-Semitism? Is there anything new to 19th century anti-Semitism? Let me put in a plug for Eric Lindquist. Uh, Eric Lindquist is one of the jewels of the University of Maryland. Uh, he, uh, uh, we have a fantastic library. Um, in history and the social sciences, and uh, Eric Linquist is one of the librarians who is making that possible. So if there's anybody here who's listening that has anything to do with funding the library, please uh, fund the library. Uh, the um, Nazism was a radicalization of 19th century uh, traditions. Uh, and the uh, the tradition of anti-Semitism in the 19th century uh, was one that encouraged pogroms or ghettoization or that rejected equal citizenship. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the rejection of citizenship, the refusal of integration, uh, of equality, that was a commonality in 19th century anti European anti-Semitism. But this distinctively genocidal component that we need to murder all the Jews because Jewry itself is a danger to the rest of humanity, uh, that, that I would say was more a, a specifically uh, 20th century phenomenon. One of the, uh, uh, the, the, the prominent biographers of Hitler, uh, like the British historian Ian Kirchhoff, uh, um, or the earlier work by Karl Brocher, have made the point again and again that, that Hitler was not an original thinker, that his accomplishment was to take many, many different strands that were already in existence in the 19th and early 20th century and combine them into this explosive brew uh, of, of the radical conspiracy theory. So Eric's excellent question, uh, raises this historian's issue, which is, um, and many historians have addressed it. And actually, it's the, it, it, is, it is the starting question of my book, The Jewish Enemy. Uh, okay, there's the Book of John, there's Martin Luther's The Jews and Their Lies, there's uh, the Dreyfus Affair, there's the pogroms uh, in Russia in the early, 19th, early 20th century, late 19th century. Why did the Holocaust happen in 1941 to 45 or 1939 to 45? We can argue about uh, when the Holocaust began. Why did it happen then and there and not earlier or, or not elsewhere? Why not in France? Why not in Russia? 
And uh, that requires a whole other lecture about the specifics of German history and uh, wh why things happen. But I would say this, no World War II, no Holocaust. And uh, the uh, Hitler could, could uh, yell and scream as much as he wanted, but had he not been able to launch the Second World War, there would have been no Holocaust. And the, this close connection between the Second World War and the Holocaust in recent years has become a major theme in historical scholarship. For many decades, there were historians who wrote about tanks and planes and bombs and, and battles and World War II. And then there was another group of historians who wrote about the camps and Auschwitz and the ghettos and the Holocaust. And what's happened in the last 20 years, thanks to work by people such as Christopher Browning or Saul Friedlander or Richard Breitman, uh, 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 or, or Yehuda Bauer, uh, I mean, they're, uh, uh, go on and on. And the German historians, by the way, who have done superb work. Uh, uh, Jürgen Förster, Manfred Messerschmidt, uh, 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 Ulrich Herbert, uh, 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 Michael Wild, others, uh, Sibylla Steinbacher. As a result of this community of historians in Germany, in Israel, the United States, Britain, France, we now think about these two vast events the Second World War and the Holocaust as inseparably connected to one another uh, in many, many ways. And uh, so the, um, uh, that's a long answer to Eric's question, very good question. I, um, but I think that that is, uh, I that connection between the war and the Holocaust uh, is a major contribution of the historiography of the last 20 years, of which we are very proud. And uh, it took an enormous amount of work in, in, in many, many archives. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to bring it to, uh, Omar Bartov too contributed to it. I'm glad to bring it to the audience's attention. Thank you. Uh, from Katie Ellison, are there clear points of comparison you can outline that define the core differences between anti-Semitism and racism in the United States? And yes. What say about our responsibilities to ourselves and to our neighbors as Jews living here? This is delicate, so I want to, um, uh, I want to speak as clearly as I can um, about the similarities and the differences between anti-Semitism and racism towards people of color. Racism towards people of color rests on the assertion that there is a connection between skin color and qualities of mind and character. It's an absurdity. It's a fiction, it's a lie. But at its core is the idea, which is ridiculous, that white people are smarter than black people. And that people of color, therefore, in the 17th century, were fit for working in the hot and humid fields of Brazil and the southern parts of the United States that white people did not want to do, but that black people were perfectly fit to do because they lacked intelligence and they were strong physically. This assertion of inferiority stands at the core of this repulsive tradition of white racism. It is not a conspiracy theory. It is not an assertion that black people are going to take over the world. It is not an assertion that people of color are going to dominate the globe. And therefore, it is an ideology that justifies their enslavement, their exploitation, their persecution, their humiliation, violence against them, mistreatment. 
it justifies all of those things. And it has justified on the passage across the ocean and in the, in the enslavement, millions of deaths through mistreatment, malnutrition, all the things that, that the questioner is I'm sure familiar with. So this is an evil uh, and it is one that has led to these very famous results. So far, at least, it has not led to a genocide. Now, when I say that, I do not mean that it has not, I do not want to underestimate or minimize one second the harm that it has caused to people of color, which has been vast, enduring, and horrible. And so we must fight it and stop it and bring it to an end. But anti-Semitism is not based upon color because the Jews in Europe, for one thing, looked a lot like the Germans who were killing them. And they looked a lot like the non-Jewish Poles or the non-Jewish Hungarians or the non-Jewish uh, Ukrainians that they lived alongside. As I stressed in my talk, anti-Semitism is not about what the Jews look like. It's about what they're alleged to be doing. And because of what they're alleged to be doing, they are dangerous and they are powerful and they are smart. And people who are smart, dangerous, and powerful should be killed, all of them. And that inherent connection between anti-Semitic hatred and genocide exists. Maybe my, African, my, my colleagues who work on African-American history or the history of slavery and racism in the United States would not agree with what I've just said and we could have an interesting discussion about that. Uh, but this is not a difference between which of these traditions is more immoral than the other. They are both immoral and disgusting and repulsive, um, but they are different. And you asked what I think the differences are. And so I, I'm giving you an, uh, as, as honest an answer as, uh, as, I, as I can. Um, we're getting uh, close to maybe a couple more uh, questions, I think. Uh, is that all right with you, Dr. Yes, that's fine. I, I mean, okay. They're excellent questions, I'm very... Yes, they are. And so this one, should anti, this is from an anonymous attendee. Should anti-Semitism in each religion to be understood not only within the realms of our faith, but also our place of living, nation, community, etc. Some religions carry some kind of role in some governments more than others. Also, what could be an action to create foundations to support for Jewish individuals in the USA in order to prevent a second Holocaust? Well, I don't, in the United States, I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not, maybe I'm too optimistic. I, 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 no, I don't think that, that we face that kind of danger. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, you know, whenever you see, use the word Western, somebody earlier used the, you referred to the term social justice. Now today, if you say Western civilization, that sounds like you're a Steve Bannon. So uh, the, uh, uh, but let me say a good thing about Western civilization, and that is that it is inherently, at least part of it, self-critical. And, uh, and, and this we can see in the way in which uh, anti-Semitism reached a peak in the 1940s, in the United States as well, by the way. According to public opinion polls, anti-Semitism peaked in American history in June of 1944, when American soldiers stormed the beaches in Normandy. That's when anti-Semitism, according to peaked in American history. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm here. I'm, I'm going to speak as a historian. We, my colleagues, the library is full of excellent books about uh, the history of Christianity, the history of Islam, history of Judaism. Uh, it's full of excellent books about. Um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill fought the war in the name of Christianity. They both were fairly devout. I mean, neither of them wore their religion on their sleeve, but in their view, uh, 
Hitler was an atheist and a pagan, and he attacked Christianity. They, they thought Nazism was an attack on Christianity. So in, in a way, the Second World War was a war about what, was, what, what do we mean by Christianity? Is it what the Nazis mean by it? Yeah, Auschwitz, is that where Christianity ends? No. Christianity is D-Day. Christianity is the Battle of Stalingrad. Christi Christianity is, is defending this Western civilization, quote unquote, against the Nazi attack on Western civilization. That's the way people thought in the 1940s in Washington and London. Uh, so, you know, I think the, the uh, uh, as I stressed at the end of my talk, the good news, the good news is that there are a lot of very smart and very engaged and committed scholars who have devoted years and years of their life to addressing uh, these issues. Uh, you know, I, um, and I, you know, I would be remiss uh, if I gave this talk and responded to questions without, without uh, mentioning my, uh, my dear colleague, Ira Berlin, uh, mm -hmm. who unfortunately, very tragically, uh, you know, succumbed to illness uh, last year. Uh, and uh, Ira was one of those many scholars who have devoted uh, decades to working, in his case, on the history of slavery and racism. Uh, and uh, we scholars, you know, uh, we leave the activism to a lot of other people, but uh, our, our quote activism is in the study and, and, and in, in what we've produced. And, and, and there's a lot, a lot there uh, to uh, stimulate the kind of self-criticism and, and, and discussion that the questioner uh, <clears throat> would like to see take place. Okay, um, I think we can maybe make it through one more. Uh, please comment on Barry Weiss's recent short book on anti-Semitism and the factors that caused her to resign from her New York Times. Are her criticisms of the New York Times applicable to the mainstream media generally? Oh my. I mean, I've read some of Barry, I've not read Barry Weiss's book. Uh, and I have read Barry Weiss's columns in the New York Times, uh, which I thought were excellent. Uh, I can't comment on why she decided to resign from the New York Times. I thought that was a mistake. And uh, I'm sad that she did. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, I, from my experience, I've been, in, I've been a professor for many, many, many years. And some days go better than others. And sometimes you're in a small minority and everybody's angry at you. And then other times they agree with you. And uh, you need to fight. And when you do fairly and with civility, when you do, uh, people will respect you. At least that's been my experience. They may not like you, but they will respect you. And uh, so I, I cannot comment on what happened at the New York Times with Barry Weiss. I think the paper, I think it's a loss for the paper that she resigned. Um, but I also want to say regarding the New York Times that it has some of the finest journalists in the world. And given that we have a president who's attacking the free press and who's calling this newspaper and the Washington Post the fake news, um, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge, I'll say it, the heroism and the courage uh, shown by many journalists of those two newspapers um, who have written quite a bit about anti-Semitism. Could it be better? Could their coverage of Israel be a little bit different? Yes. Um, but uh, I, uh, is there a cancel culture? Yes, you know. But people, if you, if you want to write about anti-Semitism, you need a thick skin. You can't plunge into this material and then say, oh, so-and-so said a nasty thing about me and then leave the field. If you plunge into this, you know, if you can't stand the heat, then stay out of the kitchen. And all the historians that I've mentioned today, and I could mention many others, who have written about these very delicate and difficult issues, have had experienced people who criticize them uh, 
and that's just part of if you get into if you get into the arena you have to accept that that's what's going to happen uh so i um yeah i think that uh the uh uh the times and the post have done a a pretty good job of addressing questions of anti-Semitism in the United States. I think, let me conclude with this. When the racists and anti-Semites on the streets of Char Charlottesville bellowed, the Jews will not replace us, there were a lot of journalists, especially the younger journalists, who said, what the hell are they talking about? This is all about the Southern monuments and Robert E. Lee and slavery and its legacy and Jim Crow. What's this Jews will not replace us? And I think that kind of deer in the headlight reaction of some of the younger journalists who immediately shifted to talking about the Southern monuments, which was an issue, indicated that they hadn't yet understood the history of anti-Semitism. And they didn't yet understand the connection between the arguments about white genocide, anti-Semitism, and white racism. But I think a lot more of them now do. And I hope so. And that, um, that now and in the years to come, what I hope is that there, those of us who work on the history of anti-Semitism will continue to find common cause with our historian and social scientific colleagues who work on uh, the, can, the, the questions of racism and prejudice towards people of color. These, these two scholarly endeavors need to be conducted in tandem and in communication with one another. Thank you so much. I think with that, we have come to the end of our time. Uh, Professor Herf, I really appreciate your Get, taking the time to give this very important talk. And I think there is so much that we have gained from your knowledge. I encourage uh, our viewers to look up your books and to purchase some of them because I think that's the best way to begin our own personal uh, deep education about this topic. Uh, so thank you again for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And, and to our you. viewers, of course, and to our viewers, we appreciate your joining us today, and we ask you to go to our website to check out our next event, which will occur on October 29, and it is on the um, reentry and reintegration of people convicted of genocide in Rwanda with Dr. Holly Nyseth Brim. Uh, so we hope you will join us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, later in October. Again, my thanks to Dr. Herf. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye. Yeah.